You're listening to Once Upon a Time at the Movies, a retrospective podcast where we look back at a classic film and take a deep dive into its history, discuss how it put its stamp on Hollywood, share our own thoughts with a superfan special guest, and ask the question, how does this classic still hold up today? Let's dive in. Once upon a time in 1978, audiences were terrified by a masked, knife-wielding escaped murderer stalking babysitters in the quiet town of Haddonfield, Illinois on Halloween night. I am your host, Juan Ayala, television and film critic over at MediaVillage.org and host of the podcast, Actors with Issues, here to talk all about the film that practically began the modern slasher genre, which remains alive and well nearly 50 years later. John Carpenter's Halloween, and joining us for this trip to the movies is stand-up comedian and Halloween superfan Gerardo Pilati. Gerardo, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hi. Thanks for having me. I of love talking horror. So uh, tell the folks a bit about yourself and why you love movies in general and what sticks out to you about Halloween. Why is it a classic? Great question. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a stand-up comedian in New York City when uh, they asked me to be, and uh on my downtime, I just watch a lot of horror movies, shows, um, just to pass the time. I like to say uh, life already was scary, so I don't think I can be scared by any horror movie anymore. So now it's just like really fun reveling in all that happens and the nonsense that they write up for some of these poor victims. Yeah. And sometimes the killers. Yeah, sometimes the killers. Um, but yeah, it's a little about me. I, yeah, I love watching all movies, any movie, but especially right now, like this is like we're in the peak of oh, yeah. horror and like Halloween, mm. spooky, spooky time. Yeah. Yeah. I always read new my AMC plus subscription around this time of year so I can get that whole library of horror films that they have because they have everything on there. Everything is yeah. on there. Yeah. yeah. We but, yeah, uh, we just did the AMC plus thing. So I'm like, wait a minute. Why haven't I had this forever? <laughs> I've been using Shutter for the longest time now, and right. I didn't realize how incredible Shutter was. Mm -hmm. And magical. now Shutter, I think, is on AMC Plus as well. It's on AMC Plus, Plus, yeah, because yeah. they were like, "Let's take it. Yeah. Why don't we take them?" Smart. So with Halloween, uh, I mean, I assume you were not around in 1978 when the movie first came out. Absolutely, You're not. obviously not 45 or older than that if you saw it <laughs> back then. But when did you first see Halloween? I think the first time I was in middle school and we had in middle school, we had like this crazy teacher, Mr. Hernandez, and he decided that one uh, that like uh, fall, he was going to show us like horror films. Mm -hmm. I want to say this was like seventh grade. He showed us like The Ring. He showed what? us. Correct. And this is a private Catholic middle school. <laughs> He showed us the ring, he showed us the omen, he showed us signs, and then he showed us Halloween. And that was like the first time I ever was really introduced to horror in yeah. that way. And I just remember being so terrified every time we were in Mike Myers' mask. That always got me. As a kid, yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm the killer. <laughs> it, I don't know why. And then I've just, ah, oh, I watched it almost every year. Mm. I'll, I'll watch at least a couple Halloween movies every year. Because later on, they got even better. H2O. Ooh. Ooh. That's one of the few great sequels out there, but we'll get into that in a bit. But um, <laughs> with me, I was like many, like, you know, 90s babies who were not around for a lot of these like classic movies. And I watched it on AMC Fear Fest every October. Just these oh, constant right. marathons all October long. And, um, you know, they had like, I think on what was it back then? Uh, ABC Family had like their 31 days of Halloween or but those weren't the horror movies that was like the hocus pocus and the yeah the cute ones yeah but i was so into horror mind you i love i still love horror movies obviously but like i wasn't the type who like growing up was like oh i wasn't scared like oh no i was horrified i would give myself nightmares like thinking like oh my god michael myers is like in my dark closet and i don't i can't see him or you know if it's like the grudge you're like oh my god she's gonna crawl down from the or you know it's or if you see static on the tv the ring like i was one of those kids but i loved those movies i love that weird sense of like dread and fear let's keep your adrenaline up and then i you know grew up to be an actor so it's like <laughs> you got to channel all it that worked out yeah movie. <laughs> yeah it worked out you're still using that adrenaline just kicked in differently yeah after the ring i couldn't look at a tv for the longest time 
Mm -hmm. I would like watch TV and then when I turned off the TV, I had to be in the other room and then I'd point the remote and turn off the TV. <laughs> I would get so freaked out. And again, that was in seventh grade when I watched that. Yeah, oh, that was man. one of the because you know, people are always like the early 2000s, like the horror genre was like on a decline. I'm like, um, I we had The Grudge, which was a solid remake. The Ring was a solid remake. Um, of course, I'm like blanking on all the other movies that were around that era. But like, I feel like the 2000s was more paranormal. A bit, Isn't yeah. That when, like, we got Paranormal Activity, that was... Yeah. In Signs, the... as you mentioned, that was, Signs. like, mm -hmm. earlier in that. Yeah, it was definitely, like, we were over the slashers. Even, like, the Scream sequels were, like, starting to, like, you know, Scream 3 was kind of... It just kind of showed up, and people were like, oh, and then it was done. Uh, and then, yeah, like, things did get more paranormal, now that you mentioned it. Yeah, it was a lot of, like, ghosts, aliens, spirits, mm -hmm. possession movies came back. Well, because Paranormal Activity came out and it was like it basically dethroned Halloween as the highest grossing indie film of all time. And everyone's like, oh, cool. Let's just do that, which is what they did with Halloween when it came out. They said, oh, Friday the 13th. And let's that just that. kept going. Right. What's another holiday that's creepy? <laughs> we can rip off literally. <laughs> I'm still waiting because like we're getting we're finally getting like Thanksgiving. Have you seen the trailer for the new Thanksgiving? Movie? I haven't yet, but that was like. An Easter egg in another movie, right? Is that? I think so. Yeah, it was like advertised. It were like it popped up in another movie for a second, but now we're finally gonna get like a Thanksgiving Day movie, like a horror mm -hmm. movie. I'm very excited because I think we need to give Halloween a break. Start giving other holidays. Yeah. <laughs> demon, movie, like, how fun! Like Flag yeah. Day, give Flag Day like a monster. <laughs> God, that would uh, be great. Or Easter, give Easter a really good like. A murderous I feel Easter like there bunny. is one. That probably, yeah, that already exists, doesn't it? So um, there's a great, as we were talking about um, AMC Plus, and speaking of Eli Roth, because I think Thanksgiving oh, is yeah. his movie, right? Um, mind you, he started a whole movement along with Saw and like the whole torture porn era in the early 2000s was like between Hostel, Saw, and all those types of movies. That was a big thing too. That's where all the, like, the gore was amped up. But uh, with... He has a great show on AMC Plus called Eli Roth's History of Horror. And every episode focuses on a different subgenre of the horror genre. So there's like a ghosts episode, a holiday episode where they talk about Silent Night, Deadly Night, and April Fool's Day, and Happy Death Day. And all, like it's such a great show. You know, they do, and it's like talking head interviews with like Tarantino, with uh, Jamie Wait, Lee. Where is this AMC Plus? AMC Plus. Eli Roth's History of Horror, everyone listening, everyone watching, check it out. It's so great. Mm -hmm. This month especially, it's like, and then they did, I think they did a season in 2021, and the first episode was like uh, disease. So it was talking about contagion. It was like, you know, we're a year after quarantine. COVID. Talking about, yeah, quarantine, contagion of, I think, virus. They talk about it. They talk about a whole bunch of, there's like actually a couple like underrated movies that actually do quite a bit of deep cuts with these. They don't talk about just the mainstream ones. Um, but yeah, great show, really cool interviews and sort of like bringing up movies that you may not have even heard of. I didn't hear about most of them because those are all like direct to video movies in the eighties yeah. and it's you know, deep you can that, access like, those. No now. one watches. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cause like, where would you find it? Right. And Sleepaway camp was another one, you know, like all these types of movies, like, okay. yeah, I'll check this out. Yeah. I'm <laughs> So um, before we dive into the movie and sort of break it down, um, I want to do a little bit of a deep dive into the production of the movie. Okay. So with a Halloween, it was John Carpenter was just coming off of the success of his first feature. I believe it was his first feature, Assault on Precinct 13. And he was contacted by producer Erwin um, Yablons, who came up with the concept of a serial killer stalking babysitters in a quiet town setting. And Yablon did some research and he found that there had not been a film with the word Halloween in it up until that point. So he figured, well, that's the perfect backdrop for our movie. So they called it Halloween. And then they got the funding. It was made for just about $300,000, which with inflation is about $1.4 today, which is about the same budget that Saw had, which takes place in like two rooms. And it's funny, both X and Pearl also were made for a million dollars but that's like today that was like a couple of years ago which is insane oh that they made it at such a low budget but also it was a lot of young actors and people you never really you know they could get them from get them on the cheap <laughs> i mean britney snow and x still gets me oh yeah i i watched x like three times mainly just for britney <laughs> snow 
because watching her come out from that like strip club with the gator right next i <laughs> i didn't even realize that until like the third time and i'm like wait a minute <laughs> what a great movie yeah um she was in prom night the prom night remake yeah oh he was I great in it too that. i thought it was Fantastic. pretty solid there yeah. was a couple again this is like early 2000s there's a couple of those remakes that were really good i really liked when a stranger calls as well oh, i thought that one was really was fantastic. well done so halloween with its three hundred thousand dollar budget went on to gross 47 million dollars at the box office and became the highest grossing independent film of all time for decades until paranormal activity came along and a fun fact about the role of dr loomis so peter cushing who many folks know i believe he played van helsing in one film one of the many dracula movies of that time and it was also of course governor tarkin in star wars um and then christopher lee who was dracula in one of the dracula films and had done a bunch of horror movies they were both offered the role of uh, dr loomis but it ultimately went to donald pleasance um who you know when you think of like the ultimate bond villain it's donald pleasance i forget the name of the bond movie but it's but dr evil is based on him he was like bald he had the scar he had the cat the gray suit like that's dr evil that's who they're oh, making fun of it's oh. so icon but uh he had oh. just done that a few years before and uh he was only filming for five days of the 20 day shoot so they did all of his scenes within a couple of days because you know he was arguably like the the name in the movie because this is jamie lee curtis's first film um all the other actors were fairly unknown i think only the actress who played linda um pj souls i think i'm not sure if she had done carrie already but she either went on to do carrie as like the main cheerleader bully girl or she had already done it then uh nancy i think nancy loomis was her name at the time uh she had done john carpenter's previous film assault on precinct 13. so these are all basically john calling in favors from friends like hey want to do my movie and there were many hats being worn by many different production crew members multiple people ended up playing michael myers for certain shots where like they had sent nick castle home but they're like oh wait we need this one shot of him just standing there and then it's funny there's like one shot in the movie where you can tell that it was someone else because myers is from a distance but he's like oh he's shorter <laughs> in this <Yeah>. shot <laughs> or he's walking funny uh or Why yeah it was tiny <laughs> I'm scared uh, right now but but yeah breaking down the movie itself so the film opens up with this you know iconic sequence uh many people think it's one shot they couldn't physically do it because they're using film i think they cut like one or two different times i think the first time they cut is when like the mask comes on that's where they could do right. like a clean cut and then oh they gosh. kept filming from there uh but opens up with this tracking shot it's this point of view of an unknown individual picks up a kitchen knife it's on a mask heads upstairs and stabs this young woman she yells out the name michael so we're assuming okay this is someone named michael they know each other and then the person leaves the house the mask is taken off and you see a six-year-old in a clown costume holding a bloody knife just like catatonic what like talk about like a twist opening like there probably wasn't another twist opening like that until like i don't know scream maybe like yeah those types of openings that just like stay with you. I think like that's kind of the most memorable, yeah. not to, you know, say anything about the rest of the movie, but arguably one of the most memorable sequences in the whole so, movie. Yeah, absolutely. Just watching a kid with a knife. That's pretty, that's pretty dangerous. Right. <laughs> what if he slipped? <laughs> <laughs> There's no stunt pay. This movie was made for nothing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, kid, that kid probably got three bucks and they were like, just hold the knife. Yeah, just hold it up. Yeah, that was a great shot. And yeah. it was. It was the first like reveal that we get, but it's like immediate. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, it wasn't that's a weird hard. twist ending. It's like, nope, twist is up top. You yeah. buckle Twists up, is, kids. We know exactly who it is from like jump. Yeah. And it's a child. <laughs> and then uh, 15 years later, uh, psychiatrist Dr. Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance and nurse Mary and Chambers, make their way to Smith's Grove uh, to take Michael to court. But they find there are several patients wandering out on the grounds. During a storm, they realize something's up and Michael ends up escaping, steals their car. Someone gave him driving lessons at some point and he makes his way to Haddonfield. <laughs> and then we meet Laurie Strode, a high schooler. 
uh, who notices that same car is parked outside of her classroom. It's following her friends around town. And there's a guy with like a mechanic's jumpsuit and a weird white mask who's stalking them from a distance. And Lori and Annie go on to babysit on Halloween night. Unbeknownst to them, still being stalked by Michael. And one by one, Annie, Linda, her boyfriend, Bob, are all killed by Michael before coming after Lori. Uh, Lori becomes like the penultimate final girl uh, and survives the night thanks to Dr. Loomis, who shoots Michael six times off of the second floor balcony of the house. Loomis rushes to the window to see the body and it's gone. And then we just hear Michael's eerie breathing from under the mask in that creepy theme. Doot, 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 doot. And uh, the boogeyman remains at large. So Gerardo, looking back at the movie, what did you love? What sticks out to you the most? Um, first of all, I'm I love the term scream queen. <laughs> and I think this was the original scream queen. Did we have somebody before her? No, that was Jamie like, Lee was the, definitely no, the right? first. She coined the phrase the scream queen because of her screaming. Mm -hmm. I a a that was my favorite part. Anytime she screamed, I was just like, wow. What a great scream you <laughs> What have. a great scream. Because Lord knows that a lot of other horror movies, you know, I feel like it should be part of the audition process. Okay, cool. Give us your, like, give us a blood curdling scream. Absolutely. And so well, many times it's show? not. <laughs> no. Do you remember when there was, this was mid 2000s maybe, or like earlier? I don't know. There was that Scream Queens reality TV show where they were looking for the next Scream Queen that was going to star in. Uh, like uh, Saw 5 or something? Saw 5 or, yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. random. I they none of them really did justice. There's only one girl on there that maybe could scream, but then they had to do all these other challenges. Mm. How was Jamie Lee not really in that? How dare they? She oh the right, you'd think she'd be like a guest host or something. You think but... she'd at least be the judge or a right. judge for an episode? No, she didn't even. They did not nothing with her. They're like, go away. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking love Jamie Lee. Um, what else sticks out? Something else that sticks out for me is always. Uh, I'm a huge Real Housewives person. So the fact that Kyle Richards, is <laughs> the sister, always gets me. I was rewatching and I was like, "That's Kyle Richards." Yeah. Look at her. And sister. she comes back for and like the, the new ones, and she does great. I was, you know, she, she hasn't acted solid. in Lord knows how long, and she's so, she was so yeah. good. I was, you know, I thought it'd be like the Shot. most like, scene uh, scene and chewing yeah. performance ever, but it was really good. I love like the long those long tracking shots they did. I remember there's um, I'm a huge obviously horror nerd and a huge documentary nerd too, especially when it comes to filmmaking. So there's this one, there's another series on Netflix called the movies that made us uh, every episode yes, focuses on a different yes, movie. Yes. The Halloween one was really great, but they talked about how of the $300,000 budget, I think they used like 75,000 for the camera, which was um, a Panaglide camera, which you like strap on to steady cam. But it yeah, gives yeah. you those long tracking shots instead of like like walking shots yeah, that we get those of, follow like shots point sidewalk. of view yeah. yeah it just gives like that cleaner eerie like just you're following yours in their footsteps and that's almost like off-putting because you're like oh so i'm being stalked now cool that <laughs> it just sets up that tone it's so well done um yeah but it's also funny that. though because when you notice you know i've worked as a background actor a ton over the years and you just notice everything in the background of movies these days. So one of the funny things is when you're watching it, there's certain shots where it's very clear they're not in Illinois. You're like, oh, they're in Los Angeles because there's palm trees in the background that they didn't take out. <laughs> uh, but in the documentary, they said that they had like, you know, they filmed in the spring. So they could only find like two pumpkins. So they couldn't redo like the takes of like Tommy falling and like crushing the pumpkin. Because they're like, we've got two of these. We have we to only get have it. Two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then like reusing it for a jack-o'-lantern in an earlier scene and then, you know, turning it around so that it's just like a new pumpkin. Um, and different. yeah, the low budget filmmaking. Yeah. Um, mind you, in future ones, I think they had to paint like watermelons and gourds and things like that because they just couldn't find anything yeah. uh, for those later sequels because they always filmed in the springtime because they wanted it to come out like, you know, six months later. And they had like two garbage bags full of painted leaves to be like brown and orange. Fall. Yeah, because it just, but everything else is like bright green. The grass is luscious. The trees are, you know, bright green, even though there's like brown leaves everywhere. It's, but it's just, 
it only it only happens when you're like paying attention to that stuff but otherwise you just love the atmosphere of the movie i'm just i'm just you know i have like fucking you're like, like look how bushy this grass is it would <laughs> never be that bushy if it was really the time <laughs> Oh I've never even looked at that. Now I'm gonna go mm. back. No one will look at it. <laughs> well, once you watch these like documentaries of like the making of the movie, it like you just can't watch it the same after that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And uh I mean the score of the movie as well. I mean, it's just like an oh, iconic yeah. score. I think John did it in like three days. He only had like that long to do it, and it was just him and a synthesizer, and it sounded like an orchestra. Yeah, uh, which is brilliant because you know, these days scores are like still you know think of like star wars or these big movies it's like a full orchestra and a professional recording and this is just him and a synthesizer and um does the same thing for the modern scores for the newer halloween films he did the scores for that and it was just a couple of synths yeah i didn't know that <laughs> wow you're blowing my mind with this <laughs> good for him wow i feel like in most movies nowadays we don't even get like real scores it's just like one person on a piano and then they just like add bullshit to it later and they're like right. look at the score we've made for this one song that we have and then we yeah. add lady gaga to the to the <laughs> vocals and then here we go we made a score and it's like yeah. no you made a song you made a song good for you now sort of going to the opposite is there anything you didn't like in the movie um i think my mind now has just been like i'm more uh i like newer stuff because of the quality mm. of certain videos but i still appreciate so much of what they did do so for me like the shots where he's just standing by the fence mm. and she's just like upstairs and we're looking down and i'm like that's him <laughs> i love that and i hate that at the same time <laughs> i love that and i hate it at the same time because now i'm like couldn't we hide him a little better i mean he's literally it's broad daylight <laughs> It's broad daylight. It's summer in California, and that man's in a jumper. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> but, like, have you watched The Nun? Yes, I have. Okay. So, one of the things I think it was the director that was talking about, he wanted to create the silhouette of The Nun anywhere you kind of looked. And now that is imprinted in my mind where I'm like, oh, oh right. God. If I think I see the shape of a nun, I'm immediately terrified. Yeah. Because he has trained me now to see the shape of a nun or the idea of a nun and be like, murderer! <laughs> and i wish they almost took that and we're like why don't we give the silhouette of what mike myers would look like and just put it in different places yeah i would have loved that but i still yeah. love those shots because they're classic he's standing by like i think it's like sheets that are being dried outside and i'm like right, right. there's a man in a worker's uniform <laughs> does no one see this and he has this white mask on what are we doing i think that's the only thing that i'd be like maybe not maybe not this yeah You'd think that because he's like among sheets, they would hide it a little better. It's like you already have cover. It's not just him in a field. It's like you can hide him. But mind you, it's very funny when like for like these newer films or like the many, many remakes and multiple reboots and mm -hmm. all of that that's been done. Things like what, 13, 15 movies in this whole franchise this is insane. Yeah. Um, what is it? There's eight, the two Rob Zombie and then the three. So 13 total. And they still want to make more, which is insane but uh once you find something to make money you're gonna you're gonna milk it and that's yeah. what they're doing boy i just hope they get good writers because you know the quality of the script just continued to go down and down and thankfully the wine scenes aren't going to be involved because they kind of ruined the last couple of films because of their over involvement um they were the wine scenes yeah they were head they were the head of dimension films which did like oh okay yeah, six yeah. h2l and resurrection they're in charge of those mm -hmm. and those are like sorry that's like three of the worst ones except for h2l that one was like actually a really really solid movie i love that one but you know resurrection come on that movie was absolute garbage wait now i'm trying to remember which one resurrection is where they're like doing the they have cameras strapped to their heads they're trying to like survive oh, the night and they're in Michael like Myers surviving house. the night there yeah 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 Buster Rhymes says good. trick or treat mother and Tyra Banks is in it for some reason like just it's just oh god that's great that right. was at least LL Cool J acted time. really well in H2O but you know you've got Buster Rhymes just improv and they leave it all in just very confusing Anyway, back to this I Halloween. Yeah, go back to this one. I was like, oh my god, that was awful. Okay. <laughs> I personally don't have much that I like that stands out to me that like I didn't like. Maybe some of the kids' performances, like, okay, kids, let's bring it down. 
Jamie's at a seven, you're at a 12. Let's, let's match the energy here. But, you know, their kids work in a low-budget movie. Can we really complain? So who do you think gave the best performance? Who stands out to you the most? Jamie. Jamie's number one. I will say Donald, I, I do enjoy Donald because I just find him like, he chews the scene a little bit for me, which yeah. I love because I'm like, oh, right, you are the lead. And I think maybe he went into it in my mind. I have I need to go back and watch documentaries and see what actually happened. In my mind, he was like, let me just make this chicken shit film and let's see what happens. <laughs> Michael is evil. He's the embodiment he's of all the, things. Uh, of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. He is the embodiment of the devil in hell. <laughs> I think he was just really fun and, and yeah. yeah. I like the friends as well. They weren't like standout performances, but I just love like the chemistry that was among them. It's funny how they oh, sort of wrote the script. So um John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, who was his girlfriend at the time, she also was a producer of the movie, they co-wrote the script together. Right. So he wrote the like the Dr. Loomis stuff and the Michael Myers stuff. And uh Deborah focused on like the girls dialogue the girl. because oh that's cute it's like you give us you know a straight white guy like write teenager talk and it's going to be completely different from what another from what a woman writes um and I just love there's this one I wrote down this quote specifically because it's just a funny moment I thought you were babysitting to me the only reason she babysits is to have oh, a place shit to... I have a place for that <laughs> it is such a under it's such a like because you know there's this isn't a comedy so it's not like a boom type of moment like but it's just such a funny line and deborah is so smart for writing that because it's like she's reacting to like the interruption and the lead the up actual, and like, it's so clever. yeah yeah that's really funny i didn't realize that i knew she wrote it but i didn't realize she focused on the girls because that makes yeah. a lot more sense as to why i'm like oh these girls don't sound like fake they do sound just like right. girls in school very yeah. natural yeah, just like talking about boys, talking, talking about class, cheerleading practice. Yeah. 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 And it's like so of what? the time back when it was like normal to walk home in your small suburban town, to walk yeah, home from school, to pick up the kid you're babysitting, all of that stuff. I feel like now it's like so different. People don't like let their kids walk home. Un understandably, you know, that stuff's gotten like a lot worse with like, you know, kids getting abducted and whatnot. But yeah, it's just Have such a big time. It feels so, it feels so old school, you know. Yeah. Wait, have you ever babysat anybody? Like my not nephew. Your own? Okay. Yeah. Another like not family, but like another person's kid. Oh no, are you kidding? No. Really? Absolutely not. I don't I don't want to take care of anybody else's kids. What? I'll take care of my nephew because I know him and I like him. But yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Are there other people's kids? No. Mind you, I was I'm one of like twenty something cousins on my mom's side. So like there's always an older cousin to watch up to you. So like we never even had like a stranger look after us. It's always like, oh, your cousin's coming over, your sure. grandma or whoever. Yeah. Yeah. So what about smart. you? Okay. Did you ever babysit? Yeah, Were have... you babysat by strangers like that? Uh, I was babysat by like neighbors hmm. if we needed anything. But we were like, they weren't strangers. We like knew them. Right. Like they were like the older sister, like our neighbor's older sister. And she would hmm. always just be there and be like, okay, we're here. I have babysat in the city and it's wild. <laughs> it's wild babysat. Kids like the taking city. the subway by themselves. I've like witnessed it. They're just like with their backpack and they're walking home. I'm like, what on earth? Absolutely not. Not in my house. Yeah. Oh. So here it's like, they what's the other option? Do everything alone. Right. Yeah. What are they gonna do? Get in a car, which they can do, but they don't want to. I <laughs> once had an eight-year-old be like, Why are we gonna get an Uber? The train's right there. And I was like, We have to go to Brooklyn. They're like, the train goes to Brooklyn. <laughs> and I was like, All right, let's go weird babysitting kids in the city it's yeah wild wild just the, the little adults already i feel like they just grow up so desensitized yeah. to everything they're like yeah public transit i'm part of the public let's go <laughs> it's even worse they're like little new yorkers it's right. it's on top of just being like an adult it's like oh you're an adult in new york now but you're this tall and like yeah. still read like the magic treehouse or something i don't know what kids read now but if anything, I feel like latchkey kids are like more prominent, at least in the city. People are like, OK, you go in, you lock the door, you don't open it for anybody. Yeah. So they give you the password or whatever, you know, password. <laughs> but with the, with Halloween, are there any characters or sort of like moments like characters that have sort of like broken out into pop culture or at least moments that you've noticed are like have been replicated in other horror movies that have like remained part of the zeitgeist? I think the three of them, just even having the three girls together has, mm. it, we always have that trifecta now. Yeah. I think most successful 
movies, like horror movies, have the three stereotype girls. You have the one who's like, you have the Lori, the main one, and then you have like, uh, what's her name? Uh, Nancy? Mm-hmm. Nancy? No, Annie, whatever her name Annie. is. Annie. Played well, by yeah, Nancy yeah. Loomis, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Played by Nancy, there we go. No, I was like, what's your name? I always do that. I mix up their names and the character. Um, you always have like the studious one and you have the party girl. Mm-hmm. It's always like the trifecta of like one wants to get like laid and go out. The other one's like, I don't know. I don't think we should be doing that. And then you have the main girl who's like, guys, can't we all just get along? <laughs> and it's it's everywhere. And I don't, I'm yeah. assuming this kind of started it. Oh, for you sure. See, like, yeah. yeah. Even like I Know What You Did Last Summer. Classic. Yeah, Three there's girls. at least two I've noticed. There's at least, at least like one two. is a bit more introverted while the other one's party girl. Like with Scream, you have Sydney, you have Sydney and um um Tatum, played by Rose McGowan. She's mm-hmm. like the party girl with the wild boyfriend and um mm-hmm. you know, with uh what's other uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, you have Nancy, Nancy Thompson, mm-hmm. who's like the quiet girl and her friend who's like the pretty blonde with the with the hot boyfriend and, the and always yeah or they're cheerleaders yeah. and they're like oh right. i'm just like the most popular it's always that dynamic and i mm-hmm. think that is everywhere now because of the yeah. success of that so, yeah yeah definitely started that trend and it wasn't just like all oh, horror movies with the guy with the knife it's like no all of it there's all like an it, older yeah. character who's maybe like the the wise sage who like might come in and save the day or who knows who it is and he's hunting him down or whatever or um just like all those sheriff not to call them trope there's always a cop yeah there's like a dewey in (laughs) in scream always a dewey yep uh nancy's dad in nightmare on elm street's the cop like you know it you're so right it is in every single one yeah except for maybe friday the 13th it's kind of like those movies are just any character there's just cannon fodder it's you know they're they're there to die sadly (laughs) And, you know, that whole the idea, the concept of a final girl started with this movie. You know, after this, you had uh, Ellen Ripley and Alien. You had Nancy Thompson and in, in Nightmare on Elm Street, Sidney Prescott. And now with the newer movies, you have Sam and Tara Carpenter um, with Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega. And, and, you know, they're sort of the new final girls. And, of course, you have, you know, in terms of zeitgeist, everybody knows who Michael Myers is. This franchise is 45 years old. It's it's we've had, like we said, 13 movies in that time. And it's like it's always remained out there. Everybody knows the theme song when they hear it. They're like, oh, my God, that's a Michael Myers song, you know, or or whatever. Yeah. And they might not even see the movie. They just know the mask. No, they, they just the know the mask. Yeah, they get it. Yeah. Yeah. I do love that. And even in the evolution of all of these like horrible murders, they still keep everything almost exactly the same but like just slightly tweak it yep. like when they decided to give Ghostface like a bedazzled uh little little outfit were you there <laughs> i think that's two were you there were you there for that no <laughs> uh they like bedazzled it thinking no one would notice because they're like we just want to give a little bit more panache to to yeah. Ghostface, give a little bit more to do and everyone's like wait why is this thing full of glitter like what right. happened why is y'all sparkly why is y'all moonlight. sparkly and yeah randomly just chasing people being like Dee. very clumsy though not a great choice of outfit no and they're always in boots too you ever notice that whenever they show ghost faces shoes always like combat boots big and this flowing gown always tripping fringe always tripping like fringe on the bottom like this little dress what what why (laughs) why did you put that on i i will say i think michael myers has like the best of all the outfits his is the mm-hmm. most practical. He's like, I'm here to work. Right. <laughs> I'm here to work. We're here I'm... to work. We're shopping heads. We're it's so funny, heads. though, because like he always has the same outfit. And it's like never the same one because he's been arrested or captured or like in the beginning of four, he's in an ambulance. So he's in like the gown. So he always has oh, to right. find a mechanic to kill them and take their clothes. He's like, wait, guys, consistency. I'm going to. He's never in an orange jumpsuit from prison. He's never in any other outfit. It's always the mechanics always, jumpsuit. Poor mechanics are not safe so, in Haddonfield. Gas no. stations beware. <laughs> yeah. Either that or I would just, if I if I lived in that town, I would make sure any mechanic had just like a bright pink mechanic jumpsuit. So that <laughs> if if he was you know. in Hill, I don't think he'd like steal a bright pink mechanic <laughs> jumpsuit. He'd be like, damn it. Let me see if I can get it. <laughs> and then you just spot it. You can spot it real quick. Very easy. That's yeah. I did not think about that. He always does find a mechanic yeah. somehow. 
Even in uh, the 2018 one, he ends up at a gas station. Yeah, the gas station. Same thing. Like... Kills a mechanic, steals his jumpsuit. It's been done like four or five times. It's so funny when that yeah. happens. He's really sort of strong. sort of going off of that. Um, in this movie, do you have a favorite kill? So it's a strange question to ask, but which one's no, like? I love that question. That's a mm. great question. Um, I have to think. I'm. I can go first. I don't know if I have a. Go first, yeah. Okay. Go first. Let me let me let me think. <laughs> so my and I, this is one of those like sort of iconic ones because it's been done so many other times throughout the franchise. But Bob's with the knife being pinned through him and he's up on like the cabinet door or something, and him just mm-hmm. staying there and Michael sort of like tilting his head. Like I, th- I remember John appear in like one of the documentaries. John told Nick Castle who plays Michael like once once you do like once you like stab him like just kind of stand there and like tilt your head a little bit. And Nick didn't really get it until he saw the actual footage and he's like oh it's like he's admiring his work because he's so That's theatrical magical. like you know he did the whole the ghost sheet and put his glasses over it and um uh later with uh with annie he puts like his sister's tombstone over her bed like he's very theatrical bed, yeah. when it comes to his kill so it is very much sort of like he's admiring his work which is like such a smart Bravo, John Carpenter. You know, that was such yeah. a tiny little note. And of course, that head tilt has been overdone to death throughout the franchise. Every kill, he's like, huh? It's like, okay. Little much, guys. <laughs> I do like it. They A lot of franchises love to do one thing that was really successful and be like, let's put it everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Like, even if he's just standing there looking, just have him be like... <laughs> That's kind of weird. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I do like. I, you're right. I do love when he pierces Bob and then just like holds him up there, which he does a lot. Like there are so many times in the movies. Yeah, he takes somebody with anything. In four, like, he did it pincher. with the with the shotgun. He like put the whole shotgun through her body and pinned her to the oh wall. Oh my god! Right, and like threw her to the wall. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus. And then I, in the 2018 I, one, which again, fresh in my mind because I just watched it a few days ago, he does it to the babysitter's boyfriend, but it's like through his neck or something like from behind. And like lifts him. We don't actually see it, it happen. Oh. We don't see that one happen. It's kind of like the aftermath. Like one of the cops comes in and he's there up on sure. the wall with like the knife in the back of his head, like through his neck. Mm-hmm. And that's what's like oh, holding right, him to right, the wall. Right. Possibly a little slight correction because people have always been like, there's no way that kitchen knife would go through his whole body and like be deep enough in the wall to like hold him up. But now it's like, okay, it's the neck. Small piece. <laughs> there we go. How about no, now, guys? We've heard your complaints. Okay, Thank physics you. majors. Yeah. Okay, so looking back, this movie is turning 45 years old this month. That's uh, insane. Yeah, when they did Halloween 2018, that was like the 40th anniversary, which is crazy that like... It's already been five years since that trilogy started. But looking back at it at the end of the day, would you recommend this film to someone who's never seen it? Absolutely. I would do I would do Halloween now at this point, Halloween four, because I can't seem to shut up about it. Um <laughs> It's a solid I sequel. Do... I really like that one. I really do. It it's cute. It's cute. I, I did I did enjoy it, but I should not have I should have watched Halloween four and then Halloween. Um, uh, and then I would always recommend H2O. I think H2O is so funny. Oh, it's great. And it's, it has scream like written all over it. It's Kevin Williamson yeah. came in and did like some rewrites and stuff and did like the teenager dialogue. Cause he's so good at that. Smart. Yeah. But he didn't have like an official writing credit on it. Cause I think he technically like the whole writer's guild thing. Like he didn't contribute enough to the script to get an official credit. To get a credit. It's like you punched up some dialogue. That's about it. Like you can yeah. get like. They give him a producer credit, I think, to like still involve him and have his name attached. But sure, because um, it wasn't his initial story. It wasn't his initial draft. It's like you just did a little bit of rewrite, like some ghostwriting. You know, they usually don't get credit for that. But it's Kevin Williamson. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, creator of oh, the Dawson's Creek and the Vampire Diaries. Like he went on to do so much later. I do. The more we're talking about this, about like people separately writing for like one niche, it is fascinating when it works and when it doesn't work. Yeah. I do thoroughly enjoy that. Cause like, mm-hmm. right. Why would you get someone who actually knows how to write and writes well for like teenagers? We don't right. need just like old white men just being like, this is how um, Hamity Pam Pam speaks to her, her bestie right. in the locker room. <laughs> I did not, I don't know why I didn't even think about that. That's pretty great. That makes a lot mm-hmm. of sense now. Yeah, it's always interesting seeing on like shows and movies and stuff when 
you're like, oh, this was clearly written by a 35 year old who like has no idea how teenagers talk. Like teenagers don't, yeah. do they still talk in text speak these days? Like, I don't LOL. think they are. Right, I don't, like no one really does that anymore. Like, I feel like I didn't actually know anyone who actually did. No one did it at the time. No one no. ever did it at the time. They just like decided to write kids like that because they thought that's how they spoke. Mm-hmm. And, it's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. But um, I mean, I obviously would absolutely recommend this movie. Uh, anyone that wants to watch it, it is, I believe it's streaming on Peacock. It's streaming on AMC Plus. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, you obviously can buy it on digital and all of that. But Gerardo, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And uh, for anyone listening, for whoever's watching, if they want to give you a follow on social media, where can they find you? Uh, my social media, I believe my Instagram is the Gerardo NYC because um, I'm from Florida. And uh that's it yeah that's where i post anything that is happening awesome and to all of our moviegoers you can give us a follow at our main instagram account at actors with issues for all updates regarding all of our podcasts give me a follow at juan yellow official and if you're watching on youtube listening on spotify apple Podcasts, wherever it may be please be sure to subscribe to the show to never miss an episode and if you enjoyed our chat leave us a rating or review give us a comment do you agree with us do you not agree let us know in the comments i'm juan yellow and thanks for coming to the movies with us